in the recent months, there have been a lot of customers that for the first time they shop with us online. They used to be in store customer and we saw from the data that the customer that do shop in both channels are the ones that are bringing the most revenue to the company if they're active in store but as well online. So I think moving forward, we're not only going to try to drive our business either online or in store but convert in both. Although many brands are forced to invest a bit more into their e-commerce operations in 2020 than they expected, many still have brick and mortar stores that need attention too. Foot traffic is down at local malls and on main streets all over the world, but there is a way to bring people back to that in-store experience. Audrey Gutierrez is the vice president of marketing and e-commerce for Little Burgundy, a multi-brand footwear retailer owned by Genesco. She believes that an omni-channel approach and some creative partnerships are the answer to this widespread problem. On this episode of Up Next in Commerce, Audrey, who called in all the way from Montreal, explains that customers who are comfortable with both in-store and online shopping will ultimately be your highest value customers. She dives into how Little Burgundy is driving conversions in both areas through partnerships with local creatives and businesses that bring more in-store traffic while also providing new and exciting online shopping experiences. Plus, Audrey reminds us why concentrating on the basics of logistics and shipping is what ultimately builds confidence with your customer base. Enjoy this episode. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Welcome back to another episode of Up Next in Commerce. I'm your host, Stephanie Postles, co-founder of Mission.org. Today on the show, we have Audrey Gautier, the Vice President of Marketing and E-Commerce for the Little Burgundy Division of Genesco. Audrey, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, sure, my pleasure. It feels like you're so far away. Where are you calling in from today? I'm in uh, Montreal, actually. Very cool. That's where my accent is coming from as well. (laughs) I love it. Are you guys opening up your retail stores at Little Burgundy or are you still strictly working from home? Yeah, so we open up uh, the office for in Montreal, actually. We're allowed to have like 25% of uh, the employees working from the office. So we kind Mm -hmm. of manage a calendar for people that want to go back to uh, working from the office, but also like everyone can actually work from home if they prefer as well. Very cool. So before we dive into Little Burgundy, I wanted to go through your background a bit. I saw that you've worked in the world of e-commerce for about a decade. And I wanted to hear what drew you to e-commerce and a little bit about your journey. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I first started my career um, after a master in administration. At the beginning, after my studies, I really wanted to work for ad agency. But just like after interviews, after interviews, it got me really in the retail world. So I started for La Vie en Rose, which is the also a Canadian-based retailer out of Montreal. It's a lingerie retailer. Could be similar at a smaller case to uh, Victoria's Secret. Mm-hmm. And I quickly fell in love with just like all the opportunities of e-commerce and the endless possibilities and creativity that goes like really beyond like the activation that we're doing, but also in terms of like troubleshooting. Really, it's what got me in e-commerce. And then after I got an opportunity within the uh, the Aldo Group, and then continue my career in footwear since about seven to eight years now. Very cool. So what have been some of your favorite campaigns that you've worked on over the years? So one of my favorite campaign was actually uh, the first time we shot abroad. So we went to uh, Mexico City and worked with like combination of talents that we brought with us from Montreal and some others that were local based. So that was just an amazing experience to be able to shoot abroad for a campaign that was like going to live both in store and also on the digital side. So really exciting. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that, that's like recently just like navigating through COVID and our new reality, coming up with our fall winter campaign and trying to really 
kind of connect with the customer with this new reality and just like reinvent ourselves was really um, really fun and different and challenging, but at a good, uh, good end for me. I'd love it if you could highlight what Little Burgundy is. Yeah. So Little Burgundy is a multi-brand retailer. So we started back in 2008. We were initially launched by the uh, Aldo Group and acquired um, by the Genesco Group back in 2015, so about like five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're really boutique-filled retailers. So we only have like 38 stores. We're pretty strong on e-commerce as well. But even though we're a nationwide uh, retailer, we really tend to do things locally and try to connect with local communities. Our stores look a bit different from every region. We try to partner also with like local influencers, local artists and ambassadors. So I would describe us as really, I mean, a multi-brand retailer that carry brands like Dr. Martens, Converse, Vans, brands that you can get like in a lot of other retail stores, but we really still, even though we're multi-brand, we really have a strong artistic brand DNA. That's great. So when it comes to forming partnerships with the local talent or the artists, how do you guys approach that? Because I think that is really important when you're walking into a really fun, nice shoe store, you've got good music going, you've got good art around, but how do you guys think about finding new artists or finding people that are a good fit? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, searching, I would say, especially taking into consideration that doing business in Canada and most specifically in the, the Quebec province, we always have to do everything in French and English. And that goes as well for even the music in our stores. There's uh, certain laws in Quebec that you need like certain amounts of songs that play in your playlist in store that needs to be in French. So we need to find like to manage our playlists in stores so we have enough like French songs and local artists from Montreal. But that goes as well from like people that are connecting with like artists uh, that are musicians, for example, from Toronto or Alt West are really different than like the people that are connecting with more local based Montreal and French artists. So there's a lot of researching from my team either uh, through connections and contacts or Instagram, Facebook, just always trying to be in the non of like who's up and coming. And also we're, we're still a pretty small player. So budget wise in terms of collaboration, we really love to just like be highlighting new artists that are up and coming and not necessarily the ones that have been like yeah, seen around by every other retailers or partners. That's really fun. That seems like such a great way to lift up the community and really help out a lot of people. Like you said, the artists and people who are doing really cool work. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about, so you have your retail stores opening back up soon, and you also have your e-commerce stores going. Tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about the omni-channel approach and how you want to sync them together so it all feels similar. I see really that like regardless of the channel, we really need to provide the best, very best experience we can to our customer. In the recent months, there have been a lot of like customers that for the first time they shop with us online. They used to be like in-store customer. And we saw from the data that the customer that do shop in both channels are the ones that are bringing like the most revenue to the company. If they're active, like, in store, but as well online. So I think moving forward, we're not only gonna try to drive our business either online or in store, but really have them like convert in both. And some initiative in regards to that for us on our end will be solution like we call Bopis, for example. So you buy it online and then you can go within the next hour in your favorite shop and just pick it up and like maybe spend a bit less time in store but at least it's reserved, it's for you, you know, like you can try it, try your size, especially in footwear, because it's quite, it could be quite tricky in terms of size. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go in store, have that experience, but it's more like fast and easy because you've done your pre-shopping online, you reserve your item, you know, it's waiting in store for you. The sales assistant is there to maybe offer you alternative product if that doesn't uh, work for you. So 
I think all that omni-channel experience and improving both the in-store but as well the online is going to be key. Same thing with um, with just the shipping and return as well. So, I mean, if you decide to go in store, try the product, we don't have it, we currently order it for you and then it can be delivered to either the store or your home. But we need to do a better job at just like shipping faster, same day delivery without pain, returning it like the way you want, either in store or to a delivery location without any cost, without any kind of trouble to go through or you don't have to call customer service. So I think on the logistic end, that's where we're, we're actually going to win in the upcoming years of uh, e-commerce. I love that. Yeah, I saw on your website that it said you could return a shoe within 365 days. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So that's something uh, we always been actually doing with uh, with Genesco. The only thing is we've never really been like pushing it. So through COVID and the closure of our stores, that was the type of messaging that we were putting like up front of the customer just to reassure them in their process, especially for the new digital customer that we're used to maybe buy in store and become more comfortable with returning in store the next week or within the next two weeks. Yeah, I think that's so important to get someone to feel like there is no risk with buying if you can get it back to in a year. How are you thinking about, it sounds like such a good idea to have people come back in store so they can get comfortable with the experience and get a part you know, of the in-person experience that you guys have built up. So how are you thinking about other ways to drive them in the store that maybe isn't competing with the free shipping? Because it seems like it'd be hard to want to go in store if I know that I could buy something online and ship it back for free for a whole year? Yeah, um, it's been an ongoing question, to be honest, since uh, we've been reopening our stores. I mean, traffic has been, even prior to COVID, it was a little bit like down in malls and it was like already hard to get customers to actually go in store. Our job is even like tougher in terms of like really just increasing that traffic and really making sure that the customer do shop as well in store. So we're looking at doing like special launches and special partnership as well. I think a good way of like winning, especially in tough situation like we are, is doing like partnership maybe with other retailers. We recently have done a partnership as well with um, RBC Bank in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that was a way to get new customers. I mean, downtown is pretty much still dead for us in Montreal as well as Toronto. The traffic has significantly decreased overall, not just in shops, but in restaurants and bars and every places. But for the ones that are still going downtown to maybe like give a special promotion that they can get on their lunch break or something like that. So we're really just trying to work more closely with like other retailers, other partners, the malls also itself, or if it's a street um, store to work with like the neighborhood of like that, uh, that store to find like partnership and ways that we can like all together bring more traffic to, to our stores. Very cool. So what kind of launches or partnerships are you seeing success with right now? What kind of things are you trying out that are working? Yeah, so the RBC um, partnership that we've done, so it was basically giving like an exclusive offer to the RBC bank members. So it, it was successful in the way that it brought a lot of new customers to Little Burgundy and there were also like high value customers that were spending more than average. So in a time where business is tough, uh, definitely that, that was a good win for us. Another one is like we have the student price card uh, in Canada, which is basically it's called SPC and it's giving like discount to uh, members of SPC when they're a student and could be applicable in multiple retail location. So that's another way that like uh, other partnership that we're seeing that it doesn't change the entire business, but it does add up at the end with multiple type of partnership like this. And I think Another good way of like winning is working closer definitely with the malls because we're 
at the end of the day, we're in the same boat. We're all seeing like the decrease of traffic and difficult business. So I think we need tighter communication with the malls and partnership. If they're doing an event to really involve the retailers as well, with one of the mall regroupments here in Canada, Kids Like for View, they're doing kind of an incentive during the holiday. So if a customer buy um, Kids Like for View $100 gift card, then they can get like a special items in like certain participant stores. So that's another way of kind of like, again, in terms of traffic and partnership, try to get more customer into our doors. Yeah, that seems like definitely the way of the future is figuring out how to partner with people who are around you to create really good experiences. Yeah, it seems very smart. Are there any metrics that you pay attention to when you're forming these partnerships and these spatial launches? So um, as I was saying, like with RBC, the average order value, the revenue is bringing, uh, but also in terms of long-term, are they staying customer? The acquisition that we're doing through that partnership, are they going to redo a purchase in the next six months, in the next year? Or that was really just a one-time to get a promotion, so it's a little bit less valuable for us. Mm -hmm. So um, these are definitely metrics that we're paying attention. That's great. So how do you keep customers coming back? Because there are so many shoe stores, so many competitors out there. How do you engage with your customers um, in a way that keeps you top of mind? Yeah, um, good question. And definitely a good challenge being a multi-brand uh, retailer and with also increasing competition in terms of like just the offer out there uh, with the multiple retailers and also like big players, even from the States that are coming in. So, I mean, for, for us, a good thing we've always been, uh, well, actually, I think we've always been good at is um, showcasing the product in a different way that our competition does, but also that even the brands are doing themselves. So we showcase advanced product in a, in a different style or different like aspirational look than what Vans would do or what a foot locker would do. So I think that's what a, one of our advantage because it's, it's, uh, it seems to work with our customer. And from like previous survey or focus group that we've done in the past, they always say that like Little Burgundy, we, we do things differently, but in a good way. Like we, we, we succeed to stand out even though we're not the biggest player. And even though we don't carry all the product, but we have the reputation of carrying like a good selection of product like mm -hmm. if you want a footwear that you know is on trend it's maybe not the most fashion forward that you would see on a red carpet but at the same mm -hmm. time it's a safe choice in terms of like being on trend on trend sorry being one step ahead of maybe the, the core people but at the same time uh, still being affordable price so we kind of like are in a good position in terms of, uh, of like our offer and how we present it. Yep. I think that's a good space to play in because who really wants to wear the red carpet stuff anyways? Most <laughs> yeah, of that exactly. looks a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so on your website, you mentioned that the you have a magazine that goes out every season. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So... Our uh, magazine, we actually launched, launched it since the very beginning of Flitterberg and D. And it's always been kind of like at the heart of like who we are. And like, I remember when we were part of Aldo, like everyone wanted to work for the Flitterberg and D division because it was like with our magazine and all our artistic direction, we were doing like things like always a bit more edgy. And that was just a really good vehicle for um, our brand DNA and to show Little Burgundy again, like differently than other vintage brand retailers. And that being said, like about three seasons ago, we stopped doing like the printed magazine and really went more with digital version. So we still do those strong, like artistic direction, like campaign. Uh, every single season and we create like a specific team for a season where we're gonna like do articles and work with like artists etc 
So similar content with what we would have done for the magazine, but we're really doing it more for the digital. So assets are optimized for digital. We're doing like more video content as well. We're uploading articles on the website. So we move away from the printed magazine basically because of like the cost of printing, but also we're just like able to track a better return on investment with everything we're doing online. So it's been a, a tough decision when we first stopped the magazine because it's been like part of our DNA and the heritage of Ludeberg. And the, even in the office, we have like all our covers of the magazine that are showcased like in the hallway. So <laughs> we've all been super proud of it. But like just like with the, the world changing, we took like more the digital direction uh, in terms of content and I'm not saying that we're never going to go back to a print version of the magazine, but for now, we're really more focusing on still creating like good content exclusive to Little Burgundy that has always like a really defined angle, but we're really optimizing that content more on the digital side. Yeah. So to dive in a little deeper on the digital magazine aspect, what kind of engagement are you seeing on that? Like when you send it, I'm guessing through your email or wherever else, like how, how many people or how many of your customers engage with it and read the entire thing? Yeah. So we, we split it. It's not a magazine like it used to be like a full issue. So it's more, uh, we're, we're kind of like releasing content as we go throughout the season. So it's more going to be true blog article and, and just like a newsletter that is more informational um, but it's not like in a format of like a full magazine, like page one, two, three, et cetera. Oh, so we see that like people are, it's just funny to look at like engagement of people in certain articles versus others. The latest one we released, I don't know if you got a chance to see it. It's like really, really small article, but it was just on like LB's dog. So the dogs of people working at Little Burgundy and Obviously, uh -huh. it involved dogs, like not at all related to the shoes. But it was interesting because we got a really wide reach of people engaging uh, with that article and just spending more time on our website. So at the end of the day, in terms of PIs, we had a good returns, even though uh, it was not like direct sales. But again, it's like content that are just making us a little bit stand out from the crowd and have customers just like going on our website, spending time with us and engaging with Little Burgundy instead of spending that five minutes with the on foot locker, for instance. <laughs> yep. I love that. I think anything with dogs or animals probably would perform well. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so when you create content like that, how do you also keep Little Burgundy branding on there so people know, you know, who brought this content to them? without, you know, hitting them over the head with it? Like, how do you make sure it's engaging, but also does the job? Yeah. So in terms of like letting the customer know that it's from Little Burgundy and this content that is brought to us through, let's say, paid advertising ads or ad on Facebook or Instagram, like that's why we really like launch campaign that are very different, that are very like LB driven and that are a little bit more edgy than what you would see, like maybe another retailer uh, medium. So we're really trying to have our ads running, but really with a strong artistic direction. So if you see a blonde stone ads on your Instagram, and then you see a similar ads with the same background or the same artistic direction, but for Vans on your Facebook, you can still relate that it's probably from Little Burgundy just because of like the artistic directions. But it's really important for us. And I think it's one of our strength uh, as a multi-brand retailer to be able to tell a story through our blog, our newsletter, our in-store window with our own tone of voice, even though we're going to like market Dr. Martens, Adidas, Nike, like any other brands. So when previously you were owned by Aldo and then... In 2015, Janesco acquired you, which is an American brand. Mm -hmm. What did that change look like? Did you have to change your tone of voice or your design or were there no changes at all? Uh, no, there was definitely tons of changes. 
And it's been a, a big journey because, I mean, you're detaching a, a business that was already very tightly attached to another business and then you're reattaching it to another like strong structure. So mm -hmm. it's been a, a couple of years actually just going through that process and being able to like be fully running on new platforms. Like we pretty much changed everything like the POS in store, our shipping carrier, our like warehouse, every single aspect of the business has been like scoop out and look at and we, we needed to kind of like confirm that yeah we're, we're moving forward with that third party or not so it's been a lot of uh, work i would say in terms of acquisition from both and even like from people working from literary and but also with aldo and the genesco folks as well in terms of business i feel really fortunate that it's actually Genesco who acquired us in terms of like they're a multi-brand, their expertise in retail, they've been around for ages and being part of like the Journeys family, they're like a multi-brand retailer as well as us. While Aldo was like a first class business, so we were always a little bit like the outsider within that structure. Joining Journeys, they're really more similar to us in that sense of like being a multi-brand retailer. So for a small player like us from Canada having like only 38 stores, I mean, it gave us access also to the eye management of like certain brands we're working with. So we all have always had like our good, strong relationship with our brand partners in Canada, but now we also have access to getting like more involved and knowledgeable of the strategy more globally from our brands. So that was definitely a win with for, for Little Burgundy within uh, this, uh, this acquisition, actually. And if I can add to that, I'm also glad of our Aldo heritage, just because of how it put us like knowledgeable of footwear, being like from a first cost company that were like working with manufacturer all around the world and like creating their own line of products. So I feel we're the perfect situation that like our previous family was actually like making shoes in our new company, they're really strong in retail and with brands. So I feel we're, we're really gaining from a little bit in the end and uh, in this acquisition. Yeah, that, that's great. I'm sure that Genesco and the brands within Genesco are learning a lot from you all. But what are some of the biggest insights that you learned from being able to see into these other brands that were kind of similar to you? Like maybe where you, you know, have been able to see how other brands do things or how they track things or how they do things with retail, where you were like, oh, we weren't doing that before. And now we're going to start implementing that. I would say like one of the yeah, big learning that, that I saw from like being part of the Journeys family, they always have this tagline of like uh, Journeys is a family with an attitude that cares. And that's true, like they're really super transparent, like sharing data, involving the team from like the coordinator to the designer, the, the part-time like employee in store to the store manager. They're really involving like everyone from the company to almost sit at the same table and really share knowledge. An example of that is at the POS level in store, we have a, a button that is called feedback button. So anyone from the store employees can like hit that button and send directly their feedback to the various team from the head office. And even all the management team, we have access to the feedback from the store. So I feel that transparent communication that we have within the company is such eye opener for, for everyone actually. And there's just a lot of transparency between what's actually happening from the sales floor to the office decision that are being taken. So that's definitely a good learning that, that I had with uh, joining journeys and seeing really that family vibe is just to connect more with people that are from the stores to know their reality, know their feedback from the customer because they're really at the front line. Mm -hmm. So I feel that within this company, we, we do succeed as uh, with just like bringing back together the office team and the sales team, which is beneficial even for, for the web business. Like so many feedback that we get from the stores, then we're like, oh, okay, I didn't thought of that for even for e-com. So we can apply some changes as well 
for the website from inside we're getting from the sales associate from in store come in from a, a customer for example that's yeah really smart it seems like that's a great way to empower the you know retail employees because i think we've all been in a retail store before where you can just tell the employees there are not happy they you know don't feel excited to come into work they don't feel a strong connection with the brand but it seems like really smart to start empowering them so then they feel like you know they are a part of the success so what kind of um, disruptions are you preparing for within e-commerce? Yeah, so there's been a lot of, uh, I mean, upgrades, like with the store closure uh, in March and just like really putting all our focuses on actually like the web business for a couple of months and seeing like how it's kind of like overall helping the business. We've been at fueling and investing a lot in like e-commerce upgrade. So on our end, we've been like launching, for example, affiliate program or working with, with partners like Curlate for more UGC content on our website. We're going to be soon launching with Paybrite, which is allowing like to pay multiple payments as well. So for mm-hmm. us that have quite a, like a high average order value for Boots, it's going to be um, quite good in terms of just helping overall conversion on the website. And other um, kind of big changes we're, we're going to be seeing is in terms of just the inventory management and being able for the customer to not only, again, like uh, make a purchase online and then add it, ship it to the store, but also like go and like pick it up within the next few hours at their favorite store to try them on. So those are some of like the kind of like disruption in our model that we're seeing for the uh, the upcoming months and that we're just trying to fast forward because and like act a little bit faster than maybe we would have expected at the very beginning of the year knowing that there's definitely like a lot of opportunities with ecom right now and that we're really on the, on the on a hill that we're going up quite fast i'm not sure if that sounds yeah. right in english but <laughs> yeah, that we've we've actually heard that from quite a few brands of, you know, the plans that they had for maybe three years are now happening in a matter of months. So yeah, similar exactly. theme. While you're doing all these e-commerce upgrades, are there any new pieces of technology or tools that you're implementing that you're excited about? Yeah, so um Paybright, I'm actually quite excited about it. Um funny enough, I think that the solution we're using in the US is uh, Klarna. I'm excited about it. Prior to COVID, I was like a little bit not sure about implementing a solution that will allow our customer to pay in multiple payment. I just felt it doesn't necessarily feel right for just a pair of shoe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like a big sofa or really expensive purchase. But knowing a little bit like the economic situation we're in, the uncertainty, the fact that so many people like lost their job too, I feel a bit more confident and, and sure about like adding it. And I'm curious to see also the result if it helps conversion. So this one, I'm, I'm quite happy. But overall, like the, the, our buy online pickup in store and more real time inventory is definitely the, the biggest change. I think there's a lot of good like AI solution and a lot of good like front end optimization, but most of the retailers still have a little bit of trouble with their back end and like just decreasing their numbers of cancellation or shipping faster or having good return process. So the improvement we're doing more in terms of inventory management and being more reliable in that sense, like that's definitely what I'm uh, looking for the most. Not the, I mean, the most, um, the prettiest thing that we could see on the website or things like that, but it's really something that on the long end, it's just going to give confidence to our customer that like we're able to commit to a fast delivery or just that like if you order from us, you're actually going to get your product and it's not going to get canceled, etc. So I'm really excited <laughs> about just the basics. Yeah, that, that's cool. I mean, real time inventory seems really tricky when you have multiple brands that you're working with. Yeah, but at the same time, we we own the inventory and it's being like either shipped from the stores or the ah. warehouse. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes it a, a bit easier to, to manage. All right. 
So I'm going to shift us over to a lightning round. So the lightning round brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. This is where I'm going to ask you a question and you have a minute or less to answer. Are you ready, Audrey? Yeah, I think. <laughs> What's up next on your reading list? Next on my reading list is a book from Margaret Atwood that I've been like looking at for ages and just didn't like took the time to read it. I was always reading something else. So it's called in French, uh, La Servante Écarlate. And in English, it's The Unmade Style. So I just never oh, got to yeah. read it. I know everyone like read, read it before, but uh, it was never on my table. So that's the one I'm currently starting. That's great. You'll have to let me know how it is. Yeah, sure. What's up next in your travel destinations or where did you just go since you were just on vacation? <laughs> Yeah, so I just came back from vacation um, on Monday at noon, actually. Uh -huh. So I went to, it's a small island in Quebec, actually. So it's called Magdalena Island. It's a fisherman island, really cute, like red cliffs. And this, like you're surrounded by the sea. There's tons of like, just like really welcoming people. They have like even a weird French accent. So for an Anglophone, it might be a little bit tricky, uh -huh. but it definitely worked uh, going there. Oh, that's fun. I'll have to check that out. What app are you enjoying most on your phone? Currently, <laughs> I've been spending a little bit too much time on TikTok because we recently, for a little burgundy, uh, just launched a TikTok channel. Uh, and my team, uh, like, I mean, I didn't even add it on my phone. I obviously knew what TikTok was about, but I never spent time on it. Recently, my team has been just pushing me like videos to watch and just like to kind of like be more aware of like that platform and our customers that are on it. So I've been spending a little bit too much time on <laughs> this app, actually. I feel you there. I end up going down a wormhole where I start with just a couple of videos and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, I just spent 20 minutes watching dancing and makeup tutorials, <laughs> and mm -hmm. organizing your house videos. But that seems like a perfect platform for Little Burgundy. Yeah, exactly. All right. And the last one, what one thing will have the biggest impact on e-commerce in the next year? It's tricky. There's so many things that are happening uh, right now, but I think for Canada, shipping, the cost of shipping is so expensive here. Obviously, like Amazon and big like players are just setting up the bar very high for like fast shipping delivery, low cost, etc. So for smaller retailers for us, and expectation from the customer just like getting higher. I think like shipping carrier and negotiating prices will be very um, challenging, but could be a, a key changer. One of the company that you should actually maybe include in a, a next podcast from a, a guest from Canada. Yeah. Uh, they're called Altitude Spa. They're like really, I think they might even be in their thirties, like two, if I'm not mistaken, two guys from Montreal who launched that e-commerce website. And they just announced that they're doing same day delivery, um, currently in Montreal, but mm -hmm. they're looking to launch as well in Toronto. So if you're from Montreal and you purchase before, before 1 p.m. in the afternoon, you're uh, safe to get your order the same day. So these type of services are oh, wow. definitely game changer, but I just think it's, it's hard to get there and still being profitable. So that's, that's definitely uh, an area that's like, we're going to keep a close eye on. Yeah, that's... That would be interesting to hear how they're, you know, the economics behind that mm -hmm. business and how to guarantee that. That would be a good, good interview guest. Yeah, definitely. All right, Audrey. Well, this has been such a fun conversation. Where can people find out more about you and Little Burgundy Shoes? Yeah, so about me, uh, definitely on uh, my LinkedIn. So Audrey Gauthier, if you can spell that right. And uh, Little Burgundy, well, I invite you guys to go on our website, littleburgundyshoes.com. We currently don't ship in the U.S., but we're really looking forward to it eventually. So it's still worth to stay tuned and, and look at what we're offering. Very cool. Thanks so much for joining. No problem. Thanks to you. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. 
Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.